prepare lessons and activities to bring about conversion to Christ and his gospel. I want to, this is a really great teacher council. We have we have those who've been around for a couple of years. <laughs> and we've got those who are brand new called teachers. So can we just kind of put our collective heads together? How would you answer this question? What is our role in the conversion process? Let's start with that one first. Facilitator. Facilitator. Explain for me what you mean by that, Frank. Providing opportunities for them to find, ask, process, share, apply. Okay, how do how do you do that, Mrs. Educator, <laughs> who has already professionally been trained on this? What what do you say to a teacher that maybe doesn't have an educational background? How do you do that? Uh, I think so. One of the things I do at the very beginning is if, <laughs> this is your seminary class and you're going to be here. What are your expectations of me? Let's start there. Yeah. What do you need from me? Right? Do you need me to be upbeat? Do you need me to be sad? Do you need me to keep the lights low? It's early in the morning. What do you need? <laughs> um, what should I expect from you? And then we kind of talk about what, what can we expect from the Holy Ghost? So we set up from the start, like this is going to be a discussion-based class and, and that there's safety in that and there's security in that. And then it finding those pieces of the lesson, knowing your group of, okay, this is a great one for them to talk, to share, to present. They're right. gonna take this, whatever that looks like, they, they can be an expert in this area, it doesn't have to be the whole thing. Or yeah. maybe, we, we made a commercial one time, right? Whatever that looks like, where they are- Active. Interactive. Learning. Yeah. And I think you'll get the deepest responses from them when it, uh, Elder Anderson would say the classroom should look more like a gym, <laughs> fitness a fitness center. <laughs> that that you're you're there to train them on how to not hurt themselves, right? Just like a personal trainer, so they don't they know how to properly use the equipment. You're gonna show them how to use, and then you're gonna you're gonna give them opportunities to practice it, and you're gonna be there to kind of help and shepherd, facilitate. That's really really great. I saw a couple of hands, Brother Bell, and then who else had that? Okay, go ahead, Brother Bob. I think for those of us that have gone on missions, we you you saw in your investigators that they had to do something, right? Mm -hmm. So what our responsibility as missionaries were to help them to facilitate them yeah. to do something, whether it be to read their scriptures, to pray, to go to church, to keep the commandments. Yeah. And I think as seminary teachers, it's the same thing. You know, when if you could, as a missionary, you could have this family you thought was wonderful, and you would teach these lessons. People would have tears in their eyes, you know, and the, the spirit was there. But if they didn't do something, they would not progress and they would not be converted. Yeah. Whereas if, you know, if we can get our kids to do those things that help you to be converted, like read the scriptures, go, go to seminary, yeah. um, you know, all that, all those things, I think that's how they'll be converted. I love converted. it. I love it. I think the most important role we have is to listen to the spirit and to be willing to uh, change plans and change our lesson if needs be. 
And because what's going to really convert them is the spirit. How many of you is terrified of that prospect? <laughs> Walking in with your lesson plan, you got the curriculum figured out in your head. And then you have that moment where you're like, maybe this isn't what they need. And you got to switch on the fly. Does that scare you? I think it's good to tell them that too. Tell them, hey guys, I had this lesson planned. And this morning, right before I got here, the spirit told me to talk to you about this. Yeah. Or you're starting off in your first question and you hear the response and you're like, oh, they're in a different place. <laughs> and you got to make that adjustment because that's they're in a different place. Please. So that has happened to me so often that I stopped spending. You stopped preparing. <laughs> 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 Anybody want to ask her any questions? How's it? How's that going? Yeah, I love, I love that for you. Go ahead. It actually goes the best when I don't over prepare because you got an hour to fill. Doesn't that scare you? I used to, but I'm on your four, and so now I'm used to it. Okay. You're used to the you're used to the beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the hand up. No, I was just gonna say I, I don't find it terrible. I find it uh interesting. You know, we'll do that a lot. We'll we'll have something prepared and or I'll have it. And at the end of the class and all the kids are leaving, we're like, Did you feel that? Did you see what happened? You know, that shift that uh where the spirit just came in and he was over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's amazing. I and here's my my one caution. Um, how, how do you guys feel when you feel the spirit? Does it like energize you? Does it like you're like you start to feel the feelings and and then you have all the thoughts and therefore it stops being a you know a gym. It stops being you know an exercise and it's and then it becomes here's what I'm feeling and here's what I'm feeling. right. This is what the spirit's testifying to me and you all get to sit and listen to me say it. Don't don't do that. <laughs> When the spirit's in the room, you know the spirit's in the room. You get them to 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 operate in that feeling in that environment. That's that's where the rubber meets the road. Is they're going to start feeling it. You can ask some really inspired questions of your spirit. That's a that's what you do. You don't need to start saying all the things you just learned about the scriptures. Use that to then ask some really great questions to kind of keep that going. It's good. Yes. One thing I try to do is simplify it all is the center is always Jesus Christ. Right. I think Jesus Christ, conversion to Jesus Christ comes before conversion to the gospel. If they have a testimony and are converted to Jesus Christ, he will lead them to truth. And that is how they'll find answers to their own questions. I love it. I thought another hand. Over here and then right here. One of the things I noticed this in primary, but I it's worked with seminary too. A lot of these kids don't even they don't necessarily know what the spirit feels like. So sometimes when I'll notice that they feel the spirit, they actually start getting more rambunctious and more rowdy. How do you feel about that? <laughs> no, but it's so it's feel the spirit, but shut up. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> you can help them know that that squiggly feeling that they have could be their way of I call it joyful noise. Embrace the joyful noise. When they start getting this, they start feeling it, they're going to get excited. And they may even say some things that you're like, all right, calm down. Like they, they may even <laughs> get a little bit inappropriate, but they're feeling it. So harness it, harness it. Have you guys, you guys seen the Venn diagram? Um, here's where we live. Okay, you've seen a Venn diagram. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are we getting the receipt? Yes. <laughs> There, there are three things that you are responsible for as you deepen, as you deepen their conversion to Jesus Christ. And shall I say that second part of how can we prepare lessons, activities about conversion, where we're actually focusing on proper like doctrinal focuses. And this is what it is. You've already kind of heard these catchphrases. We say it all the time. I just want to make sure you're understanding it. Number one. If your classroom experience that you've been prepping and that you're currently having in your class, you got to make sure it is, as she said, Christ-centered. Okay? What is that not? Can you tell me of an experience in a classroom 
where it stopped being classroom experience, uh, 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 Christ centered. What does that look like? Yeah. We did a game that got so competitive and they were really mean to each other. Jesus is gone. <laughs> the good one? What else does it not look like when it's not Christ centered anymore? I please. Half the class we just went is under strain off the story timer. Who is most guilty of straying off in a story time at a seminary class? Okay. Just not about you. You may have some really great mission experiences. And please share those, but share those. Okay. <laughs> it's not the lesson. You're you're doing that as a, as an exclamation point to a principle that's already been found. And where do we find those principles? Scripture based. Okay. We have, we understand what that means, yeah? What does that what does that look like when it's not scripture based? Well, we can't really talk about that. <laughs> How much time do you spend in the scriptures in a classroom uh, classroom setting? Is the scriptures just the jumping off point? Like so we're in Alma and he wrote a letter to his son. And he says to, you know, go no more after the lust of your eyes, or however he says that one in your life. And then we're done with that scripture. Now we're going to start talking about law of chastity. We never go back to the law. Beware. There is power in the scriptures. And I promise you, you will not actually get yourself in trouble in a lesson like chastity if you keep it scripture-based. In fact, I would say that about most of the things. You will be safe doctrinally if, if Alma is who is saying the thing and you're a second witness to him. Right? Okay, scripture base. What's the last one? You guys know? What would you say is like the last element of a seminary experience, a seminary class experience? What is it? Student focus. Student focus. And where do those meet? Magic. Right? If you ask yourself those three questions as you're prepping any lesson, how is this Christ-centered? How am I based in the scriptures? And how is my student or students the focus of this experience? I promise you, you can't go awry. And you get really good when they change everything in the moment. When you start to feel that flow and there's, there's a certain logic to a seminary class experience, and when you're in that flow and they kind of veer you off and they ask you some question that you hadn't considered, all you have to ask yourself is, how is this connected to Christ? And then ask them that question, right? As long as you keep these in your mind, nothing will knock you off your feet. Yeah. Um, okay, question. So with it being like Christ-centered, yeah. I've subbed seminary a few times and I noticed that when I start, and granted, like each time it's kind of like maybe the first time with the class, over and over again and so i kind of start with like hey like, how was your week guys like what's new uh and then sometimes it goes to talking about stuff that's nothing to do with church at all like you're talking about twilight and i'm asking who's team jacob who's team edward like and i'm like trying to get to know the kids and maybe build some rapport um yeah obviously we're... You, you can sense when it's time to bring it back in but do you feel like there's a place for that when it has nothing to do with christ at all is that helpful or is it more helpful to just Avoid things that don't have to do with mm -hmm. press at all. Mm -hmm. what do you think? I always start off with some kind of attention getter, but may not necessarily. I mean, yes, sometimes I'll do that too, but but I don't know some way to get them mentally in the room. In seven a.m., you gotta have some way to get them. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's right. uh, this, this is fun too. Scripture based, right? True. Favor no weapon. Meaning. I mean, you don't get stuck in a rut. So. Yeah, if that becomes your thing and that's like the thing, then maybe you need to start rethinking. I think it's, I think that is absolutely appropriately student focused as long as that is what you're doing. Do you remember from the summer training with Elder Renly? Do you know what I'm talking about? Twinkies. Twinkies. What about the Twinkies? Twinkies? Twilight. Is Twilight's Twinkie? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. What did he say about Twinkies? Did he say, thou shalt never use Twinkies? No, they're yummy. No, they're yummy. No, what did he say about spiritual Twinkies? 
Don't just feed them. You cannot feed their diet full of spiritual creatures. But can you use them? Absolutely. He used them. He literally used Twinkies <laughs> as an object lesson. <laughs> and he's like, this, but that wasn't the point. He just got us going. And then he was able to then go do this really masterful, here's how you teach and stay focused with Christ and scripture. I think also where like the relationships really come, at least from what I've seen, is when we like outside of seminary, maybe I mean I'm I'm grateful. I like like I have an advantage of it's like Closer to their age, you know, I'm not like, like y'all are wonderful. I'm just, we use the word in here. Like outside of seminary or going to their activities, like showing that you love like before seminary starts, like just being a friend, I think. And then when seminary starts, it's like they already know where I stand and where we're at with them. And, you know, we can get down to business really easy. Like, like no, I, I'm y'all are amazing. <laughs> y'all are your agent in this. <laughs> Please. Okay. And in order to do that, we need to trick them. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Because then they're going to be more open to you. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we're like, we really need to do that. Right. I love it. Um, who did the charter course? Was that Clark? Uh, that was Louis J. Clark um, back in the 1920s. And he says, We do not have to whisper religion in our youth. Now, I, in my generation, I, I, we probably need to change this right not my, my generation. But we're seeing in research that this upcoming generation wants it straight and they want it pure. And they are really good. They've got a really good radar when you start blowing smoke. So don't, right? Yeah. I just think it's the truth they want to Athletes have to testify in Christ over and over again. Getting glory, praise. Isn't that great? Yeah, it has been. And it hasn't been over yet. Athletes. No. And I just think that is a, there's a call for us. We we have happens. we have a generation that's ready. They're ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh they may you you may you may need to use the Twinkies, but they're not there for the Twinkies. And and they're they're there and they're ready for you. So Ask these questions in your mind. I have a couple of things in the handout on page six that that we'll probably come back to the second part of what I'm when I'm going to come back to it. Um, there was a question about doctrine, so I wanted to just give you a couple of things to kind of pay attention to, but we'll come back to that. I also wanted you to understand um, when it comes to our purposes here. Um, it may not, I've given my teachers in the Fresno States the option if they need to use life prep lessons to go ahead and try some of those out this semester. But starting in January, there's gonna be some lessons that are gonna be written into the curriculum because our students are facing some really difficult challenges and they're having some different questions. And these are really interesting lessons that are actually not come follow me scripture based, but they're still scripture based, but they're focused on students and their experiences and how they're, they're, they're going to be invited to come into Christ. I gave you an example of one of the lessons on page seven. It's the patriarchal blessings lesson. If you as a teacher, knowing your students and wanting to focus on their needs, if you feel like a patriarchal blessings lesson needs to be had, if you were to go through this, you're going to start to see some really interesting things happen. How is it? How is it scripture-based? How is it student-focused? And how is it Christ-centered? And you're going to start to see that even when we go off some follow me, we're still doing those three things. And we're able to be a little bit more student-focused. Okay? I'm going to stop here because I want to give Sister McBride 
um, all the time for this next part. I just want you to understand that you have a lot of responsibility, but you have great power at your disposal to let your students understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, turn their hearts to him, feel what it feels like to have a personal savior and redeemer, and then they're going to connect themselves to you because you are there to mentor them in this journey. It's a challenge, it's a responsibility, and what a privilege. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Did you need something up for this? I need it. Even code. Airplane code? Hold on. I'm on this one. <laughs> he said it's really easy, you just do this. So I just did this. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> You guys, it is such a joy to be able to work with um, with Ricky and Laura and Janine and all of you. Several years ago, I was on a mission, um, maybe 30, and I was in South America and I had a dream journal and my boyfriend broke up with me. So I described my dream man who was opposite of the guy who just broke up with me, 6'4", blonde, blue eyed, 200 pounds, listens to me, blah, 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 that guy in the back. I think I wrote a description of him and I never met him, but also in that dream book, I said, if I don't get to marry this guy and be a mom, I wanna teach seminary and institute and help seminary teachers. That was 30 years ago in that dream book. It took 10 years to find him, it took 30 years to get here, but this is my dream job. I've dreamed about this and I wasn't able to have kids of my own. And I think I wonder if back then I knew. Sometimes we have those inspirations or those moments. And by the way, 10 years, I put that journal away. And when I we got married and I found it and I went, oh my goodness. <laughs> I showed it to him, I said, look. And he's like, no, nah. I just wrote that. I'm like, no, I wrote this on my, this is my dream book. So this really is my dream. And we are just so excited and I love how we're combined together. And I just wanted to share a picture of some of my favorite students. Um, this purpose is really helping convert these marvelous youth and deepen their relationship and their conversion to Jesus Christ. And this class, the first day, I'm like, I don't know. Mm -mm. I don't know about them. <laughs> this is not going to work. So much energy. Freshmen, so much energy. They have my heart. I watched every day as they made choices to help develop that relationship with Jesus Christ. They were so self-aware. It was right before lunch. Early morning, right before lunch, are very similar. They're hard. <laughs> and they said, they'd come in and they'd just be so wiggly. <laughs> Such a big We're real hot. He said, yeah, I know. Can we please go pick up trash for five minutes? We're really having a hard time. They were very self-aware. So this is one simple tip in a classroom. If someone is having a hard time, you can always say, if you need to just walk in the hall for a minute or you need something, just let me know what you need. If you're angry and upset and you need to take a minute and go outside to say prayer, it's okay to help these teenagers learn to address what their need is and what they need to do to meet that need. This class was phenomenal at recognizing their needs and also asking so their needs could be met. Um, and that's part of the conversion process, right? We've been talking about conversion. I just want to review the goal before we go into some activity. Conversion denotes changing one's view in a conscious acceptance of the will of God. So we look around the room. All of us are in this process of learning to change our view to accept the will of God in our life. I am learning to bend my will. This is something I have been working on and it is very difficult. My natural woman, I think the guys must be fine. But the natural woman in me, this is hard 
stuff to change my will. But look at what it says we can do. In this process, it's continued faith in God, or faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, and the water for remission of sins, and reception of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. Conversion will come, will become complete, and will change a natural man or woman into a sanctified, born again, purified person, a new creature in Jesus Christ. We're in this process, and teenagers are in this process. Whether or not they know about it, they get to choose if they engage in this process of becoming sanctified through Christ, purified through Christ, and becoming a new creature who is here on this earth to fulfill their missions. President Nelson has referred to them as the finest team players, the finest teams as heroes. They are here to gather. Invite them to gather. Invite them to bring friends. Invite them to do what they were called to do. They are in this process. And they love President Nelson. And they love Jesus Christ. And they need our help and guidance. We're the coaches of these finest teams, these finest players, these heroes. We're the coaches. And we get to help them in this process. Complete conversion comes after many trials and less, much testing. Not a process I really like, but a process that works very well for me to learn to depend upon Jesus Christ. And in the classroom, that's what we're doing, is we're helping link them to Jesus Christ, as Ricky just testified about. To labor for conversion to oneself or another or others is a noble task. We are engaged in a noble task. The greatest work. A marvelous work in a wonder. You're not alone. We have four paid employees, and our job is to support you. You're not alone. You have state presidencies, bishops, high counselors, wonderful state supervisors. They care so much. My conversations with them is how much they care about you and the students. They are there to help you. But more importantly than these individuals, you have certain power and gifts, and President Nelson is teaching us constantly what we can do to access the power of Jesus Christ in our lives. And when we are laboring to help in conversion, that power is available as we seek it. Never feel alone. Don't let Satan tempt you to think you're alone. We will all be guided individually where we're at with the students in our room. And those inspirations will come in preparation for lessons and in the very moment you need it. The Holy Ghost is our helper to access the power of Jesus Christ in our life, in our personal challenges. Ooh, where'd it go? <laughs> what I do, Ricky? I, I don't know what you do. <laughs> oh, okay. Of course, no, you can't update right now. No. <laughs> I forbid it. Send your will to me. Okay. <laughs> um. No big deal, right? <laughs> we don't need trials. <laughs> no. There's nothing like technology, right? Okay. So, can we spend a few minutes? Will you take a second and find one of your favorite scriptures in the Book of Mormon? One of your favorite scriptures that is deep in your strength in your conversion to Jesus Christ is the gospel. What is one of your scriptures? Will you find that? And then if you're willing, we try to tear off in like, we have two, so everybody can have a chance to share. Will you share that scripture with a new friend or an old friend? And how that scripture has helped you deepen your conversion to Jesus Christ and his gospel. So take a minute and find it. And once you found it, find a friend to share. We'll just be sharing with one person today, but if I had more time, we would be sharing with multiple people. So everybody, if you'd find your favorite scripture that has helped you deep in your conversion to Jesus Christ and the gospel, and then share that. I know, this is a hard question in this group. I'm so sorry. One of your favorite, not the favorite. One of your favorite. Where's my water? As soon as you find it, ask a friend at your table and we'll share.
try to go in twos, threes if we need to. The twos would be great. My friend needs a partner. Are we ready to share yet? Then you guys share with the It's just one of them. You don't have to find the very best.
As you speak, I think of so many other different individuals who might be that maybe as ward members we might be judgy, judgy much. We might be like, oh, they they don't want to their parents go to the uh, Elder Bowler had two parents. Elder Ballard had two parents. His grand, both of his grandfathers were apostles, and his parents went inactive. Um, the dad just started working on Sunday. There were just choices, and they stopped. Church was not a priority for the family at that time. And friends invited Elder Ballard to go to seminary, and because of seminary. Chose to serve mission and he chose this path. Seminary has the power, not seminary itself, but because it's Christ centered, scripture based, and we invite students to engage in the gospel for this conversion process, it has the power to help when we don't have parents. I lost my mom when I was 13, I lost my dad when I was 18. Seminary, institute, bishops, these wonderful people help fill a role. I didn't have earthly parents. And even if we have earthly parents who are not making the best decisions, having other parents, other influences, we get to be that influence. We do not take the place of parents ever, but we can have a place where we help them feel that father's love and we link them close to the truth. Thank you for sharing that. We have two on the chat. 
one was um, Helaman 512, and she said that she found the scripture when she was in seminary, and it stuck with her. And the other one, I believe, was Alma 37.7. Yeah, and she says, um, I found mine when I was investigating the church. I still have some doubt. I was still having some doubts, and I read that and thought to myself that I should take it to God. I felt like the scripture, this was, that that was the scripture that made me feel that he needed to have a place in my daily life. I'd like to say that every teacher, you're going to know about all these experiences that impact your students, but it's a lot like parenting. And you might not be aware, and you might have the kid the year they're really struggling with their testimony. I have a student before... Um, Right before I moved here, I went and visited some of my favorite kids, some of these kids you saw pictures of, and just said goodbye at a, a seminary I worked at. And I had a young lady run up to me in the hall, and I was only there for one period, just an hour or so. And this young woman came up and just tackled me with a hug. And this was one of the students who sat in the corner, and she had permission to sit in the corner and be on her computer. And that's not something I usually allow, but she had permission to just be there. And she was really struggling that. She said to me, I was atheist that year in your classroom. I was an atheist. I believe in God now, and I want you to know I do. And her whole countenance was different. She goes, I believe in God. I might not agree with everything you wish, but I believe in God. So there might be some of those students in there that you're like, there's no way I can reach them. Nothing I'm doing is helping, blah, blah, blah. Love them anyway. <laughs> Love them, pray for them. Give them to the Lord and be patient. Patience is just handling delays and challenges without getting angry, anxious, or annoyed. And anxious might indicate we're not trusting in the Lord. And we need to give them to that because miracles happen. Seminary is a place where conversion starts and that process starts. I have an activity. I always feel like I want to make sure we give you something you can use. Do you have to use this activity? No, it's just an example of an activity. As Brother Anderson explained reading requirements of Jane. I'm like, I sometimes I feel like, okay, where are we stopping today? Where are we stopping in the reading requirements? What is it? Oh my gosh, I caught the wrong one. Um, reading requirements right now, and I love the reason they did this. I don't know if you've had some students in your classroom that they haven't learned to pray or read the scriptures at home. They're not having the regular scripture study. And we found that if we give them a few chapters, they can meet the requirements to graduate from seminary. And that's the purpose is to be able to help everyone be able to meet that goal. But the prophets and apostles have also encouraged us to help them establish regular scripture study. Regular scripture study is the very thing that leads us to the love of God and helps us experience the love of God every day. And that is conversion, experiencing that love of God. So even though we have that requirement, as seminary teachers, they have asked us to help establish habits of regular scripture reading. On my mission, I remember I was in South America. I did not speak Spanish very well. Um, and I was sitting in a zone conference and thinking about all the people we were teaching and the less active members. And we would invite them to pray and we'd invite them to read the scriptures and we'd invite them to come to church. And they didn't come. <laughs> and we'd go back and we'd invite them and we'd invite them and they wouldn't come. And so there's, I'm drawing on, I'm sitting in this class and I'm just doodling. And I'm not a good doodler, like some of your students might be. If they're good doodlers, let them doodle. Okay. So I just drew this smiley face and the eyes were for prayer. The smile was for feasting on the words of God. And the circle was for an act of service or going to church or family home evening. And my companion and I was like, let's go invite everybody to have smiley faces on their calendar. Let's just go invite them. And the miracles I saw in the lives of people were powerful. Our ward mission leader started coming to church and preparing to go on a mission. Our branch president started coming to church regularly, which is always great. Um, <laughs> the elder president compared to go to the temple and be sealed with his family. Families that we'd go visit and there was a lot of contention, all of a sudden you'd walk in and you felt the spirit. It was a stupid smiley face calendar. But these behaviors of conversion, of seeking to know the will of God and praying as a family and individual, including and making time, studying and feasting on the words of Christ, and then doing an act of service, doing something with it. Like we shouldn't be reading and praying just for our own good, right? We should be doing something with it. 
So that smiley face calendar has evolved to this. This is like, that was 1.0. We're now at like 20 point something. Um, and this is a hear him activity. In this activity, it is, I am way beyond it. Oh, here's a picture from the mission. Does he look familiar to anybody? Oh. Elder Scott Payton, he served his mission in Uruguay and had to Elder Lindsay Robinson there. And the person with the big smile. Um, I was very happy. Elder Scott said, you look very happy. I said, I'm I'm like, I don't know if that's, you get two words to say with the fossil. But that's what I'm going to say. So this activity, as we're just going to go through parts of it, I want you to think of how can this help deepen the conversion of students to Jesus Christ? And what is our role as a teacher to help with this? And a little background on me, I have taught health behavior modification. So one of the things as a health teacher in college was developing programs to help people continue these habits. So I would teach students how to design programs and we'd follow up, okay? So I'm coming with this. So we're gonna do, if I was teaching this in a class and everybody should have one, if you don't have one of these handouts. On page eight. It's on page eight, thank you so much. If you have a packet or I handed out some on some tables that you don't, if you didn't have a packet with just this. If I'm doing this with a class, the back page is a handout they're gonna turn in and the front one is for them to do. Knowing your students, you can do this as a class. You can do this as individual groups. You can do this as individuals. So an individual groups of two, or you can do it together as a class step-by-step, step, depending on your class. I have done this with hundreds and hundreds of students, and I've seen miracles, just like it's on the mission, in the lives of teenagers. What helps is this is not just a McBride program. This is President Nelson's talk with some invitations. Okay, you'll have a Word document, you can modify it. You'll have a PDF, you can use it as is, if you choose to do it. Is that okay? Like we are not saying, but I understand are saying, if you don't do this, you're fired. You're like, sweet, I won't do it. Don't, don't do that. Um, <laughs> but like, if you want to use something and here is a lesson you have for the first week of class, <laughs> you want a lesson, here you go, that one's work. Okay, so the first one is some, quotes from President Nelson from his talk, Revelation, with invitations, warnings, and promises. If I'm teaching this class, I'm going to invite you, hey, what are these, and have the students look for them, and then why do they want to increase their capacity to hear the voice of the Lord? And one of the quotes in here we have heard more, quoted more often in General Conference than any other quote. In the coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. We can reword that a little bit. In the coming days, it will be possible to survive spiritually with the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. So, will you take the next three minutes and go to page two on that? Hold on, page two. Flip over the page to the quote President Nelson, Revelation 278. Underline all the things you can do to increase your capacity. And I'm going to invite the students during their scripture study and prayer to choose one of these things to work on and have them report back. Okay. So does that make sense? So just go through those, underline them and think about if you were the student, what would you choose to do? So you just walk work going through it. You have the next three minutes. Anybody need one? Does anyone not have the handout here again? Of course, my husband does not. <laughs> Anyone else need one? Didn't get one. Oh, you have. Do it fence anywhere? Yeah. Oh, 
out there. Does anybody else need a pen? All right. Third costume. Oh, <laughs> what poor demonstration is teachers not having all the stuff out? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't send you any. <laughs> so you know, I tried that this week earlier. <laughs> So really quick, if you just shout out, what are some of the things President Nelson teaches us we can do to increase our capacity to hear the voice of the Lord? What are some of the things he invites us to do? What was that? Choose to do the spiritual work. Choose to do the spiritual work. Choose to do it. Awesome. What else? Yeah. Basically, speaking personal revelation. Speaking like personal. Open the windows of heaven. Make it possible. Whatever that is, fasting, praying. So follow the example of Joseph Smith, fasting, praying, or some specific things. What else? What else can we do? What are some specific things? Yes. Yeah. Right. Like find a place you can regularly go. Like you gotta set up what you're gonna do, right? This is where I'm gonna go and spend time with the Lord when I'm gonna do it. Finding a place, and it said a quiet place. That is one of the hardest things for seminary kids to do now. That's one of the top ones some of the students have chosen to do is to find a quiet place. I had a kid in institute this last week who said, where can I go? I said, why don't you pray and find out where you can go? Where is a quiet place? He goes, my house isn't quiet. Homes are not as quiet as they used to be. And sometimes wonderful siblings just are a little loud and cute, you know. <laughs> but this is one of the ones that the, a lot of the students have worked on is finding a quiet place they can go regularly. What else? Stand there. What are some specific things? Yeah. It says, humble yourself before God. And like humility is a Christ like attribute, and like as missionaries, of course, we've got to pray for Christ like attributes. So I think that's a big one. Like, we can't do it without the Lord. Like, if I try to work on being humble without God, then I'm going nowhere. So, and he obviously says pray. I mean, multiple times, I'm sure, pour out your heart to your Heavenly Father, turn to Him. So, prayer, but also like pray for these Christ like attributes. So praying, pouring out our hearts, but also choosing to be humble. Yeah. Just to write the thoughts that come into your mind. Write the thoughts down. We want to see Revelation as writing that down. And then there's an added and act upon forward, it. Yeah. 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 It also says to listen. <laughs> so that's one of the things I think we always tend to forget is it's not just a, you know, hey, Heavenly Father, I want this. All right. Amen. Let's go. It's, you know, you have to sit there and listen. You got to wait for an answer and be willing to listen to that answer. So if I'm doing this in a class, I would have this up and I'd have actually have students come write all the things up here. So if kids miss something, they could see it as well. Um, notice these things aren't as listening. My goal is to try to listen and how they want to do it. So they might say, after I read my scriptures, I'm going to pray after find out if there's anything I should do that day. 
including prayer with scripture study is a very simple thing. It's something we, even as adults, we skip, right? So one of the things I do is say, hey, do we pray before? Do we pray after and work on that listening? We give ideas and then I invite the students to choose one thing. If they're not praying or reading their scriptures regularly, let's put that in, right? Let's just do the basic. But some of the kids who are doing that, what can they do to challenge themselves? And I let the kids say, hey, if you want to change it, you can change it all semester long. This is for you to increase your capacity. If someone doesn't want to share their goal, that's fine. It's personal. But if they want someone to follow up, I would actually, that little handout, they fill it out. And me and even my supervisor principal, we'd go talk to each of the kids and they would share their goal. If it's too complicated, I might say, oh, just choose one. Those are all so good. Just choose one. And the key to this is it's not a lesson you just get and walk out the door and never bring up again. You want to throw in that principle of revelation. We as coaches need to follow up. And once a week, you just ask them how it's going and ask them to share. You ask them to pull up the remote. You want to be successful, you prepare the activity, we invite them to choose a goal, you review it with them, it's, you have to slow down, this isn't a, like I just did it, but don't follow my example, <laughs> um, review with them and follow up weekly, this makes powerful devotionals if you ask them to share what they're getting out of the scripture, so yeah. I think for me the biggest takeaway from all of this is that President Nelson is trying to teach us that we have to be intentional now, it's not enough to show up to church on Sunday and think that we're going to, our testimonies are going to grow and our conversion is going to deepen. It's not enough. It's not enough to just show up to seminary. It's not enough just to show up anymore where the poor people say, just show up. Just show up. You have to be intentional now. Why, why do you think we have to be intentional now more than ever? To survive? Uh, well, I think Satan is even more um, cunning, you know, and it's tricky. He's making things look, that's right, it's true, that's fine, you know, when really it's not. It's a full court press, right? Yeah. It's a full court press. They get up in the morning, it's a full court press. You know, we should see this is our recent say of Come Follow Me about Shablon. He showed up, he went on his mission, but the conversion wasn't there. And wise Alma took his son to the repentance stage, but then showed him the plan. And I agree. Because of uh, course, it makes you think Shivon's a good brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I just turned on the glass. Yeah. Okay. It's Corey Anton. Yes. So I thought that was a great wise example of us, too, as teachers. Of, he's a white son name, first of all. And then <laughs> really teach the conversion. Love that. Is that to be done or is it comment? I mean, sure, if you want to break. But no, that's, that's, uh, I was just thinking I'm automatically going through. So this is a, this would be a really great active learning experience where they can start to exercise those spiritual muscles that they're going to need as they work through it. Um, I'm looking at the pacing calendar, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where would this go? What lesson could this be that you could actually replace? There, there is in the curriculum, a role of the learner's lesson. Mm -hmm. That I would, if this is, if you're digging this, I would do this and not that. This this would replace it. Um, and you're just going to have to choose in that first week uh, what day you're going to do that. Because you can't give this its due, like, you can't give it its time and space if you're also going to try to do a Come Follow Me lesson on the same day. Yeah. So, so pick a day. This is a great first week lesson. That you could just decide if you like this one. Otherwise, yeah, like it, take a look it. at the other intro ones. So if you like this, how could you follow up with them every week? What would this look like in your classroom? You talk about that in your group really quick at the tables. What are some ways you could follow up with students on this in your classroom with your students? And if you don't even know your students yet, just be, I don't know, maybe we do this. So you really like it. I fully 
I have seen miracles in the lives of students. Students who've never read the scriptures have read the scriptures regularly. They've said, I am happier. I feel Jesus Christ's love more deeply. I'm getting along better with my parents. I'm getting along better with my friends. They notice a difference in their life as they choose to read the scriptures, study them, pray, and seek to receive revelation and learn to increase their capacity as we use the words of the prophet to help them deepen their conversion to Jesus Christ, we will see miracles. As we choose to teach students and not lessons, we will see miracles. I testify this is a way, not the way, but it is a way that can help you. We're going to take a five-minute break, and then we're going to come back for draft. Another hour-ish, 50, 40-ish minutes of some other things that we hope will help you. Thank you so much for your help. 